So security could be something like getting into a state of freedom away from danger or it could be a leverage for the loan you take. But one thing is for sure that security is important not just for you but also for the products you make. Welcome back to the channel and today we will talk about yet another pillar for AWS Well Architected Framework. This is going to be the second pillar for AWS Well Architected Framework that is AWS Security. So without wasting any more time, let's begin. So just like we saw in the previous episode, AWS gives us yet another of its words of wisdom. Here it says, the security pillar provides guidance to help you apply best practices, current recommendations in the design, delivery, and maintenance of secure AWS workload. Focus on the key pointers here. They are provides guidance and the second one is design, delivery, and maintenance of secure AWS workload. So this pillar will provide you with the measures and documentation and guidance so that you can create and deliver products with AWS that are secure and which checks all the boxes for compliance with respect to its users or customers. So imagine I'm taking your interview and I'm going to ask you specifics about your application in order for me to learn how secure your application is for the users. So for mission critical projects, AWS advises you to go for an expert review or expert review and that expert is your AWS solutions architect. And this solutions architect can also be from the AWS partners and AWS recommends products to be reviewed by one of these AWS partners for their architectural pillars. So this meeting with the architect is very important as it can get you valuable feedback for your product for the state it is in right now and can help you make changes before deployment or releasing to the market. So it's not that you should only have one team member or team who can participate in this you, or you should always include teams who are or who might be responsible for certain sections may it be for your software development or SRE that is a site reliability engineering team or even the infrastructure team and you need to understand that each of these questions that will be put forward to you or the team will validate your application or AWS workload that you have against the cloud best practices. So it's the question, the answer and the feedback that you get. So let's see a sample interview here or what we call as the review as well. So the first question that we have here is how are you protecting access to and use of the AWS root account credentials? So some of these questions might be tricky so you need to carefully understand them. So the developer here says we will be using MFA and uh, we'll have a minimal use of root imagine these answers to be multiple choice so then you might have to select one from the list of available answers so it's just like the mcq or the multiple choice questions so upon giving your answer the architect will actually give you the feedback like don't use root for god's sake are you nuts no he won't say it like that but he might give you a report which mentions no use of root that's all similarly you have to answer these questions and get feedbacks from them like the second one we have here how do you or how are you defining roles and responsibilities of system users to control human access to the aws management console and api your answer is uh, we will have employee lifecycle management with minimum privileges so that's a good answer so he actually says that's good and he might also give you additional features to be enabled so that is one of the feedbacks he might give you like for example the last one that we have here the last question that you see. So how are you analyzing and capturing logs? So when you answer, we are using AWS CloudTrail, which is enabled for us for monitoring. And we have monitoring for OS and application logs as well. So he might suggest in addition to these best practices like activity monitored appropriately. So this might be one of the best practices that he might advise. So this is just a question answer session with the AWS architect, which can give you the feedback based on the cloud best practices so that you can make changes to your application as and when you get some feedback from the architect. So now coming back to the pillar itself. So security pillar describes how to take advantage of cloud technologies to protect data, systems and assets in the way or in a way that can improve your security postures. So when you think of your application, you might have in mind the things that automatically flash in front of you, uh, which when it comes to security. So for example, authentication is the first thing that comes into our mind. So how are my users going to authenticate themselves? How are the developers and admins going to have role-based access control? 
how am I planning to segregate permissions for the users? And when it comes to thinking of the data, so you might be having in mind like that should be a place that I can store the data. How are we going to archive the data? How are we going to protect the customer data that we have? And how are we planning to monitor the application that we have? And what are the ways we can collect and analyze the data and use it for audit? Or how do we even safely expose our application endpoints to the users that are currently trying to use it? So when I throw these questions at you, you might be immediately catching in your head like, yeah, I can use IAM, I can use CloudWatch, I can use S3 and I can use AWS CloudTrail. So I can also use AWS WAF when it comes to application endpoints. And these are some of the things that actually come into your mind. But the way we implement it is the actual context here. And that is what we're going to learn how the best practices are and what they're telling us and what we can make improvements into our product as well. And that's the same reason why the security pillar here describes how to take advantage of the cloud technologies to protect data, system and assets in a way that you can improve your security postures. So let's see some of the principles that can help you strengthen your workload security or AWS workload security. So the first one is implement a strong identity foundation. So like implementing principle of uh, least privileges and separation of duties. Then we have enable traceability. So traceability is more about logging, monitoring and alerting and auditing, which can be done using CloudWatch and CloudTrail. Apply security at all levels. We have discussed this previously and automate security best practices. And then we can have protect data in transit and at rest. So this is important and should be done every time by using tokens or encryption or certificates and keeping people away from the data. So it's like restricting access to the data directly to the users, like enforcing authentication or authorization before you allow people to access the data and prepare for security events. So like by using incident management systems and one thing and one thing that is important above all is that security and compliance that we have here, we are talking about is a shared responsibility between whom? Between the AWS and you who is its customer. So AWS can provide the tools, but the way it's being implemented, it's your responsibility. Just like operational excellence, we have four routes here. So the first one is identity and access management. Second one is detection. Third one is infrastructure protection. And the fourth one is data protection. And we have one other fifth one that is incident response. We have already discussed this. So we will not be discussing this in the security pillar. And we will be discussing these in a few minutes. So grab a cup of coffee if you like, or you can buy me one as well. But when it comes to security, you need to understand one more thing that is important. So let's check that out. Oh yes, the AWS shared responsibility model. Don't worry, we won't discuss this in detail now. I just want to highlight a few points so that you can understand what your responsibilities are with respect to security. So you all know about AWS shared responsibility model. So it tells you what your responsibilities are and what are not and what AWS will manage and what you need to manage. More so that AWS tells us that security and compliance is a shared responsibility between AWS and the customer that is you. And we will get into that in a bit. So just look at the image here. So we have two sections. One is customer. The other one is AWS. So the customer states responsibility for security in the cloud. So customer's responsibility lies for security in the cloud. And AWS states that responsibility for security of the cloud. So I'll give you an example here. So let's suppose you create an EC2 instance. So AWS will help you create that by providing you the instance image, the type of instance, storage, memory and network and whatever feature set is needed for these things to perform as per your expectations, AWS will provide you that. So that is clear, isn't it? So it will make sure that the infrastructure of the cloud platform of AWS will be intact to ensure it runs smoothly. So that's AWS's responsibility. Post which if you add customer data in your instance and don't provide enough authentication measures and secure the data and it gets leaked, then you lose your job and it's not the responsibility of AWS. You are the loser. Sorry, you are at the loss. So if you read these domains here, you get a clear idea of what you are responsible for. So like when it comes to customer, you have the customer data, operating system, network and firewall configurations, client side data encryption, data integrity, 
and when it comes to aws it's more about the infrastructure of aws itself like compute storage hardware region availability zones edge locations and these are the things that surround aws responsibilities so i hope you're getting the point here so there is a basic segregation between what the responsibilities of the customers are and what are the responsibilities that aws has so please keep them in mind before you actually design your applications so the first one is identity and access management so we all want to create instances provide lambda functions store files on s3 but for that we need access and permission so in order to use aws services you must grant your users and applications access to resources in your aws account so here we will discuss about two types of management so one is identity management and one is and the other one is permission management so you might ask me what is the difference so let's discuss that the first one is identity management so we have types of identities that we need to ensure we manage so first one is human identities so human identities are the people who are requesting access to use the aws resources it could be like you me uh, it could be your developers the administrators the ones who consume the application also need access to the resources obviously and these can be from your team or customer team or the teams that you collaborate so these are human identities and the next one is machine identity so here let's suppose you're working with ec2 instance and you need to access files from s3 in your code that you have in ec2 so your ec2 instance needs permissions to be added like a role that has s3 access privileges so you see even though it's a machine it still needs access to the aws resources to perform the operation so the second one is centralized identity providers so if you are a single user or only have a single individual who is working on aws then fine you don't need to manage them with the capabilities but that's not the case isn't it so if you are an admin uh, that means you need to manage over 100 accounts or users and each group might have different access rights and permissions so managing it on a large scale is tough so for this you can make use of identity providers to manage user accounts in a single place you might have used active directory or okta as a multi factor so you can still use them and when it comes to aws using federation is a very good way to provision centralized control which also works on saml 2.0 so that's a very good uh, provision that aws provides us and single sign on or sso is also supported so you can use that and most teams actually use sso with aws organizations that is something that is very feasible so you can try that as well the next thing is leverage user groups and attributes so with a lot of users to manage and every bunch of users falling into a similar permission level and access rights it's advisable to group them and provision access rules and permissions to that group itself so when the group level membership changes you can make use of the aws sso to manage your groups and attributes so even if a person actually leaves the organization you don't have to change that particular individual's permissions you can just remove him from the group so that so he no longer has the access again so next one is use strong sign in mechanism for this aws tells us to enforce minimum password length or even educate the users to avoid common or reused passwords or even tells us to enforce multi factor authentication that is mfa with software or hardware mechanism so you might have seen if you are using okta you might get a like a sign in request where it is asking you for the approval with the okta application or even for a otp so these are basically your multi factor authentications so you can use google auth also so but it depends on the application that you are currently using the next one is use temporary credentials so this most widely used principle like provisioning access tokens that expire once you are logged out of the session for example while using the aws cli you can make use of the aws sts or simple token service to assume roles and get temporary credentials to access your resources so this is a very good way uh, to have access provisioning because you don't rely on a single credential which might get compromised in future so make use of temporary credentials and it is a very good thing the next thing is audit and rotate credential periodically so here we should always check for passwords or credentials so that if they extend a period of time that you set they should actually get rotated or changed in other words to ensure they are not compromised so regularly or periodically rotating the credentials also actually helps the next thing is store and use secrets securely so here as we know that not all services can make use of automation or automated rotation or temporary credentials 
So in order to protect your creds, we can make use of a secure place or a service that can help us do that. That is basically your secret manager, that is AWS secret manager. So you can you make use of them and with that you can easily store, retrieve, manage, rotate and store encrypted secrets as well. So that's a nice thing. So make use of the AWS secrets manager to store your passwords or credentials that you have that are being used by the database or instances that you are creating. Now let's come to permission management. So grant least privilege access. So this is something that we have been discussing from the chapter one. So granting least privilege access. So this is important So grant least privilege access. So in your team, let's suppose there are junior developers and you have senior developers and then you have leads and principal engineers for the person joining in new to the team. If he or she is a junior developer, he or she will be added to the dev group, which has the least permissions. Like he can create EC2 instance, but he cannot terminate or restart instances. He or she will only have access to the dev account of AWS or he or she can only read S3 bucket data and not create one. Similarly, you can create permission levels, which first having the least access, then when and then when the rise in the level of development criteria, then you can provision more resources later on. The next thing is analyze public and cross account access. So sometimes you might have to provision access or grant access to resources in another account. So here using IAM rules to be assumed for the identity, you can do that as well. And you must ensure you are giving access to the set of users or accounts or public internet space that are allowed access to the resource. So it's better to have prior approval of who is allowed access so that you can make the decision of who is going to have the access to your data. The next one is share resources securely. So this is also very important as you might sometime have to collaborate and share the resources that you have with other teams or accounts. So AWS recommends using AWS RAM or resource access manager, which can work with AWS organization to easily share the resources among the organizational units and accounts within them. So now that we have seen how to provision identity and access management, Let's look at the way we can detect and identify a potential security misconfiguration, threat or unexpected behavior. So it's more like someone was supposed to not do this activity, but still managed to do it. We need to find out how did he do that and what can we do to prevent that. But when I say this, when it comes to identity potential security misconfigurations, you might think how does the configuration become unsecure? And I would say the way it configures could lead to a security breach. So then how do we identify that it's a bad configuration? So let's suppose you're using CI CD and you are deploying resources. You can make use of native AWS open source or AWS partner tools to check if the configuration or if the configuration that is being used follows security best practices for the cloud. That is one way to do it. The next way is configure service and application logging. So if you have to detect unexpected behavior, AWS recommends to do that at the base account level itself. And for that, we need to record the actions on all resources for the account. So when you have a track of what is going on across your account, you can actually detect unexpected behavior easily. And in AWS services that can implement this base set or base level include like we can make use of AWS CloudTrail, as you know, whatever activity that the user carries on in the account is being captured here, like API calls, account changes, identity changes. I know you get the point. And the next one is AWS config. You can make use of AWS config as well. So this is to prevent unhealthy configurations and you can manage them properly. So make use of AWS config. And the next thing is Amazon guard duty also. So this helps in continuous monitoring for malicious activity and unauthorized behavior in the account that you have. And AWS Security Hub also is very important and I don't know many companies may be using it and many teams are actually using this, but this is a very important tool. So this basically at one place organizes and prioritizes your security alerts so that a security alerts so that you can have a collective view of what's going on in your account. So at one place you get the dashboard where you can see what's going on, who has made the changes, what are the modifications that have taken place. So Security Hub is a very good idea to implement. The next one is analyze logs, finding and metrics centrally. So if there is any issue and you want to debug that, uh, so what do you make use of? So yes, the logs and metrics is rented. So having proper logging mechanism helps detect unauthorized activity 
or unintentional changes so let's suppose someone went and deleted or terminated a ec2 instance that was actually running on a production level how did the person get the access to terminate that because you know that you have deployed the application using automation so if there is a configuration change then only it can happen so these things or these activities can be traced by using logging and the metrics that you collect but in order for you to have a security tight or tight security you need more than that so what we do we try and create workflows to raise alerts which can raise tickets in the ticketing system or raise incidents that can be sent to the concerned team and that way you have a environment where you know if there is any issue you have people to mitigate that so in this case what happened is let's suppose the ec2 instance got terminated so if you have a cloudwatch event that is actually monitoring the termination of that particular instance then that can raise alert and can send notification to splunk to log that activity or any other place that you are currently logging it with and from there you can generate alerts to your ticketing system and based on the tags you provide to the ec2 instance it can identify which team it belongs to and based on your simple notification service or email service that you have you can send the notification to the team itself so please make sure that you have this in place so i hope you got the point here so let's move on to investigate first thing that we have here is implement actionable security events so what are actionable security events so what aws recommends is that you create runbooks and playbooks to ensure that you have a mechanism in place that can help you investigate if you detect a issue so what happens here with aws guard duty that you have the output that you get is what we call as findings so whenever you use aws guard duty the output for that will be a finding so a guard duty finding actually represents a potential security issue detected within your network so when this finding is being detected or when the guard duty generates a finding whenever it detects an unexpected behavior or potentially malicious activity in your environment you can have a run book that helps simple execution of tasks that can take care of this security issue that has been detected using the aws guard duty this is one of the examples that actually aws tells us like you can use aws guard duty that can actually monitor the network and basically if there is any security threat or potential security issue that arises it will mark it as a finding so with every finding you have a run book that can help you run simple automation task or execution task that can take care of that particular security issue so that is a way to implement actionable security events so now we saw how we can trigger the events how we are sending notification but how to automate the response to the events so in aws you can make use of aws or amazon event bridge where you can create custom events that can address when an event occurs and these events can be integrated to a workflow using step function to keep it simple so you can use aws event bridge and uh, aws config rule deployment kit or development kit have that in place so the biggest advantage of event bridge is that you can create step functions so step function is basically like uh, there are five steps and let's suppose there is an event that occurs then what you can do is uh, okay first activity will send a notification second activity will send an email uh, third activity will create an incident fourth activity will create a ticket so these step functions can be automated by using the event bridge so till now we have discussed identity permission and detection so now let's see how we provide the security principles for the infrastructure so for this i want to take you back to the aws shared responsibility model so that we get the idea of how things work for you and aws when it comes to infrastructure and its responsibilities so when it comes to infrastructure you are aware of the fact that aws provides us with regions availability zones and we have local zones and we as well have the aws outpost where you can run your aws infrastructure on your on premise or that hybrid architecture that you want so my question to you is that if you create a vpc in a region let's suppose us west 2 do you own that region or the vpc that you created so ask yourself the same question again on what you own and what your responsibilities are or what you are responsible for i hope you're getting the point here and to avoid a single point of failure we host our applications in different availability zones isn't it what if one of the aws availability zones goes down in the sense there is an earthquake or some natural calamity are you responsible for the damage on the part of the hardware 
that makes up for the availability zones i'm asking this question to you are you responsible for the damage on the part of the hardware that makes up for the availability zone no you are not you are responsible for hosting the data its security and resilience for it to be highly available and with reduced latency that's your responsibility so we make use of encryption to secure that data at rest or in transit we add authorization mechanism or protect access to the data and we host our data across multiple regions or even we make use of cdns or cloud distribution networks for better or lower latency let's come back to the topic now so there are two approaches to do this so one is network protection and the second one is compute protection so when it comes to protecting networks in the sense we if we host our applications or data across availability zones or regions we should follow a zero trust approach so you might ask me like what is zero trust approach that's a good question so zero trust security is a model like a security model where application components or microservices are considered discrete that is different from each other and no component or microservice trusts any other it's not that they are friends and uh, they don't uh, they are not friends anymore and they don't trust each other so what it means is that it means that all the services hosted cannot be accessed collectively by default just because they are on the same network and the verification doesn't depend on if the service exists on the same access hierarchy for the same reason why we have access control policies in place so let's suppose we have a service a and you logged into that and you are able to access the api by using the same session you cannot log into another service the same way just because you have logged into one of the microservices because you, both the uh, services have similar access privileges you cannot do that so that is called a zero trust approach where each of the services have to be accessed independently so if one service generates token the other will generate another token for it to be accessed you cannot have mixed or single token for all the services so you do not have that as well if you are having that in your application it might compromise all the services that you have in place so that is called zero trust approach the first one here is create network layers so here some of the resources in aws may need access to public internet so so they either place them in the public subnet and assign a nat gateway or attach a nat instance to it and some other resources like your database doesn't need internet access so they should be placed under private subnet space so this layered approach to network enables you to have better security control if in case there is a failure or security breach so that is why it is called network layers because you have different layers like let's suppose one of the instances needs public access so they will be able to access the public internet because they are in the public subnet or you define that rule that way but other services like your database and your data stores may not need public internet because they don't access any of the data from outside because they are storage devices or storage instances so they should be placed securely under a private subnet only visible to the people who are within the aws network and to keep it secured from distributed denial of service attacks or sql injection or cross site scripting or or even csrf that is cross site request forgery when you are working with multiple vpcs in aws account aws actually recommends us to make use of the aws transit gateway which acts like a hub for your vpcs and controls the way the traffic is routed cause traffic between an aws vpc and aws transit gateway remains on the aws private network and that makes it more secure so aws transit gateway has been popularly used nowadays because it provides a hub like structure where it can create spokes for the vpc for the vpcs that you have and collectively the traffic is being routed from that itself and it does not have to access public internet space it can uh, route its traffic within the aws private network itself so it makes it more secure the next one is control traffic at all layers yes this one we have discussed before starting from your instances with security groups in place then to subnets with network access control lists or route tables we must have a control on the traffic flow at each layer so have control traffic at each layer and then implement inspection and protection this is also very important because as we are aware of and uh, aws also recommends us using aws web application firewalls which can have a control on the http requests that are being made which might be good or bad and you can control its flow which then passes on to the 
API gateway or the load balancer that is currently being used. And the next one is automate network protection. So here as well, we can make use of a firewall and have a protection for our network. So you can make use of AWS WAF or manage rule sets to do that. So this is something about the protection of networks. So moving on to the protecting compute or protection of compute resources. So when it comes to protecting compute resources, so what are the compute resources that we have? Tell me what are the compute resources that you know? So yeah, we have EC2 obviously. And yeah, tell me what are the compute services that we have? Yes, we have Lambda. We have batch, we have beanstalk, we have ECR, we have light cell, we have EKS, we have ECS. There's so many of the compute resources that we have. We need protection for them as well. So when it comes to protecting them, we must first talk about what could go wrong. So the first one, perform vulnerability management. So we must always frequently scan and patch for vulnerabilities in our code or the dependencies that we are currently using in our AWS infrastructure to help protect against new threats for the instances that we have. For example, if you are using a specific version of a Python package that is allowing remote code execution, so that is a very big vulnerability and the patch it has released actually tells us you to update it to the latest version. So we must do that immediately. So that is called patch management or vulnerability management. And automation is a better way to apply this across your infrastructure. So make use of cloud formation or AWS code pipeline so that you can do that. The next one is reduce attack surface. So this is something that I've always wanted to share as we do this as well, which is basically security hardening. You might not understand this if you're not well aware of how security hardening actually works. So we have to understand that we don't have a bunch of packages and libraries for our application that you might always use, isn't it? Not that it's not that hundreds of packages are being used by the application. So it doesn't make sense for you to put all of them in the EC2 EMI that you have. So let's suppose you're going to deploy an application that is going to have multiple hosts. So what we prefer is we create our own custom AMIs by adding security hardening principles to that. For example, using artifact resources, then rather than allowing the instance to download the package itself. So we store the packages that are needed or the RPM that are needed in artifactory. And we basically use them to create the AMIs that our users are going to use. And also by adding support for AWS logs and CloudWatch events and by adding security patches ahead of provisioning the application with AMI. And these things actually reduce surface attacks, which are basically a first level of attack to the operating system and its application vulnerability. So you can make use of the static code analysis as well using AWS Code Guru and EC2 image scanner and image builder as well for this. So you can make use of these. So you can make use of these as well if you want. The last one that we have here is enable people to perform actions at a distance. Social distancing should be followed here as well. So this is just to ensure that there are minimal manual interactions with the AWS tools and resources. So we should always minimize the manual interaction with the tools and resources when you're currently deploying any application. For this, you have to make use of AWS system manager, which helps you to automate tasks that are pre-approved by the change management so that you know what changes are taking place. So let's suppose you have a auto scaling group, which is currently having a scaling depth of four instances and you want to increase it to six instances. So before implementing this, you have to go to the change management board and you have to give the change request and that way you have to define which environment you are going to modify. What is the auto scaling group, the name, what is the current user space? What are the customers that are currently involved with that? What is the maintenance window? And once it is approved, your code will be accepted and then you can perform the activity using AWS system manager so that it gets automatically deployed. Now moving on to the data protection. So we all know that data is important, not just for us, but for our customers as well. So first thing is to classify the data. So how do we classify a data? So whether it is important or not. So yes, so you have data in front of you. So you might be having a document which you'd no longer use. You can throw that into the dustbin and you have some of the certificates that you need to store in your cupboard because they are important for future purpose, isn't it? So similarly, you have data in your organization that is very critical because they are of the customers or even data that you no longer use, which can be rotated or it can be deleted. 
or terminated across the organization that you have. The first thing is to classify the data. So if that's a report or a log or archive data or it's the data that has to be stored as a transaction to the database or else it's a stream of data. It could be a stream of data that has to be handled using Kinesis. So these are some of the classification that you can make or secondly, you can have data sensitivity. So if it is a sensitive data or insensitive data and if that data needs encryption or not. Lastly, if the data that is being transmitted across the users has to be protected in transit. So basically by using certificates, you can protect the data that has to be transmitted across. But these classifications of data actually help you to identify what are the actions that are needed to be taken over this data that you have. So let's talk about classification. So identify the data within your workloads. That is what I just discussed now about we need to classify the data if it is exposed to public or not. If it is, then we need to encrypt it. And if it belongs to the customer, we need to protect the data and uh, the place that is being stored at. And classification actually helps us to determine what action should be taken to protect it. So this is the way actually when you know what data it is and how you have segregated it, you know how to protect it. So that's the whole gist of it. The next thing is define data protection control. So to have control over how the data is protected, we can make use of IAM policies to control the access for different level of users, organizational SCPs that are service control policies to control the service control policies that determine what can be created or modified on what type of account it belongs to. And also we can make use of AWS KMS, Cloud HSM or encryption of data at rest and transit. The next thing is define data lifecycle management. So the data we have is subject to who has the permission to create it or modify it or delete it. And every data in your environment has its own life cycle. Life cycle in simple terms means creation, existence and deletion. This is a simple life cycle with three steps, but there may be multiple steps, isn't it? So users need to have strong authentication mechanism and permissions to create the data. Then it moves to the storage where we determine if it needs encryption or who is allowed access to this data and how we are going to delete it or how we are going to provision it or how we are going to archive it. So we need to think of ways if the data has to be archived to be stored for a longer duration. And that's how we define the life cycle. And but a life cycle management is very important because you might lose important data if you don't have that. And then the last one that you have is automate identification and classification. So as we already have discussed before, data shouldn't be served directly to the users or devs. We need to have a control policy in place to regulate the access or regulate the access. But the same, you can make use of Amazon Macy. So Macy is a very beautiful tool, but why Amazon Macy? So it's because it gives us machine learning algorithms to find out which are the sensitive data and also gives us a dashboard to see what are the data that are being modified and accessed. So if you get some time, check out Amazon Macy. It is a very good tool to analyze your data and identify and classify them as well. So yeah, that's good. So next one that we have here is we have discussed this a lot of time already, the protection of data at rest and transit. So I won't waste much of your time here. Like I've already done talking for now for how long it has been. Sorry guys for these long videos, but I feel these are important. So please understand these things. So first one is implement secure key management. Here we can make use of AWS KMS or even Cloud HSM for hardware security. We already know this. The next one is enforce security or enforce encryption at rest. So we know by using AWS KMS, you can create encryption keys, both symmetric and asymmetric keys for data encryption and decryption for the data that you store or share. Enforce access control in the next one. So we can have access provisioning using the least privileges and using data backup and versioning to protect the data that we have at rest. So having a data backup is very important because if you lose one copy of the data, you have another one that always gets synced. So a replication is also very important for the data. And the next one is audit the use of encryption keys. Every company has its own encryption standards, like what algorithm to use, how it should expire, what is the validity of the key and how it is being stored. So we can make use of CloudTrail to track changes or validate the changes using CloudWatch Insights. So there's a way to actually monitor the encryption keys that you have. The next one we have here is use mechanisms to keep people away from the data. So here, instead of allowing direct access to data or resources to the people, 
we make use of a barrier that is like a bastion host so you can use bastion host as well so that we add a layer of security here so that we can keep people away from the data that is being directly accessed before automate data at rest protection so if you're using or if you're storing data that should be encrypted then these type of validations can be done using automation with aws config rules where you can add rules to check if the data is actually being encrypted or not so if it is not then you can raise alert that this data is there and this data is not being encrypted please 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 encrypt this data and this data will be encrypted by the team that is being using this so this is some ways to encrypt your data or protection of data at rest let's move on to protection of data in transit now let's quickly finish this up and move over to protection of data at transit so data in transit is any data that is sent from one system to another that is something that is we are all clear about so if you are sending this data across the public internet space you need to have a secure mechanism of sending the data that you are currently sending <laughs> because there might be man in the middle attack what are you going to do because your data is not secure so you must secure your data at transit as well so implement secure keys and certificate management the best way is to use certificates and to manage these certificates you can make use of aws certificate manager for example if you are using tls certificates you can create or store it in the cert manager where you can actually manage its life cycle so similar to this we have enforced encryption in transit so where you can check and block unverified or unsecure http urls before it reaches your instances using security groups and you can do one more thing that is you can as well restrict them or audit these type of requests using aws cloudfront or an application load balancer as well and there are a few tools that have been mentioned here that are very helpful when it comes to protection of data in transit that is amazon guard duty amazon vpc flow logs amazon event bridge for event triggering and as well s3 access analyzer so that's all for this session but don't think we are done with aws well architected framework we will be discussing each of these pillars in detail in the coming session or upcoming session so please make sure that you don't miss out on any of these sessions coming up for that if you still haven't subscribed please do it right now and make sure that you have turned on the bell notification icon and i know these videos are very boring because these are theoretical aspects that are related to aws but i would say these are important so please make sure that you go through this but having said that, please make sure that you stay safe, stay indoors and make sure that you meet me in the next session of AWS. So until then, it's Pythonic signing off.